Prusa's released two big updates. One of them involves the XL, the other one involves materials. Let's talk about them. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. Let me know in those comments below, are you getting an XL? I am, and I'm really excited because we actually have a shipping day. Shipping is to start in January of 2023, which cannot come soon enough. There have been some crazy things going on in the 3D printing industry. Obviously the Bamboo Lab X1 Carbon is something that we can't ignore. And now the Bamboo Labs P1P. I will be doing a podcast about Bamboo versus Prusa at some point. I will actually cover it a bit in last week's podcast. We'll card to it so you guys can take a look if that's your kind of thing, where we talk about good first printers for businesses. Because there's a big difference between what's good for your business and what is good for your kid brother. But anyways, let's get into Prusa and the latest updates on the Prusa XL. Because I'm excited. I really want an XL. Let's get into the actual changes here. So we've got some videos of torture tests from Prusa, and this is good. The big thing when you look at big printers is beds. Prusa has solved this by using a number of smaller PCB heaters so that as they expand and contract, they're doing it on their own little islands, if you will, and not really affecting the other heaters around them. On top of that, they can of course turn certain ones on and off depending on the need and be able to do half and half to keep your power draw a lot lower than you normally would see. But this is interesting because this is one hell of a bed test. I don't know if I would run this on literally any of my printers. I might trust my Mark 3s's to this, but after a while, the smooth PEI sheets in some areas don't stick as well, and I do need to sand them. Let me know if you guys want to see that as an upcoming video of how we treat the PEI sheets when they start to not stick very well anymore. And don't forget to subscribe, of course. But we can see a ton of little tiny appear to be hexagons. It is Prusa after all being put on this printer and then they up it for your second layer. This is one hell of a first layer test because if any one of these little pieces goes wrong, you're going to have a problem. And that thing came out beautifully. And we can see that the load cell sensor ensures that absolutely perfect first layer every time you start a print. Now, unlike current printers that use load cells, right? The Anycubic Cobras, I believe still use them. The Vipers did where they used a load cell where your nozzle would smack into your build plate and that load cell would detect that deflection and say, oh, hey, hit the build plate. We're cool. And that's how it would do its mesh bed leveling. Prusa is using load cells to determine the pressure on the nozzle during your first layer, which will allow it to adaptively adjust its first layer height to get you that perfect first layer every single time. And when you're doing big parts like that, especially materials that could be a little bit picky about how close or how far they are, it appears that I kind of just have to get my first layer offset kind of close and it will handle everything else for me. That's amazing from a business perspective to not have to fumble around with that. My God, I need an army of these things. Now they are a little pricey, right? The fully kitted out one's about 3,500 US dollars. And that is before shipping and any upgrades that you might want to look at with this machine. And there are going to be some upgrades that come out, whether it is the bellows system for a quasi draft shield or something else. There's a lot to these machines. Oh, interestingly, they still use the cycloidal image on the website. Huh, I would have thought they would have changed that. Whatever. As we saw in the last update, which we'll card to so you guys can take a look, the cycloidal gearbox is out and planetary is in. The best guess that I have is that it's a cost saving measure as well as it reduces backlash and generally is just easier to service. We're also seeing that it is all powered by a special dwarf board with its own CPU and trinamic driver. I am guessing that they're using some sort of CAN bus assembly to send the data from the main motherboard to this 
daughter board, if you will, that will then run the extruders. But this is a this is kind of cool, right? Like, work with me here. Because if I want to change out one of my next extruders, it should viably be like one cable. And that's it. And because it's all driven on the board, let's say I get a next extruder with a big nozzle on it that's designed for high flow. And therefore, the stepper motor is turned up right? It's got a higher current. And yes, a lot of times with these dynamic drivers, you can set this in G code or you can set it inside the printer firmware. But if all I have to do is plug it in and the two boards do some, you know, magical talking to each other, there could be some real value there. Now, I don't exactly know the main purpose of this other than to kind of split the things up. And I guess also, if there are failures, you tend to isolate where the failure could be. But I honestly don't know. Let me know what you guys think. There's going to be a lot of these areas where I'm going to ask for opinions. So if you see me asking for a question, comment about it. Because obviously, this is all still speculative. I don't have a Prusa XL yet. I am on the list, and I hopefully will get one relatively soon. If I can get one by, like, Valentine's Day, that'd be the dopest Valentine's Day gift ever. Freaking Prusa XL. Like... Come on. And I like this quality of life feature. They've added some front status LEDs onto the dwarf board to let you know the current status of the next extruder, but it isn't anything extraordinary, like they're exactly saying. I do believe that there's value though. If it can tell me whether it's heating up or cooling down, if it's ready for filament, right? Whether it's a sequence of blinks or, I mean, honestly, a little OLED screen would be awesome, but I think I'm asking a little bit too much. It would be cool but it might be asking a little bit much. And now we have two physical buttons that can be reprogrammed in firmware, which is pretty darn cool. What Prusa will do with those, I'm honestly not certain. And I like that Prusa is kind of asking what people would like to see them do. I would love to see the buttons, maybe one of them allow me to just click a button for it to unload the filament or hit and hold to unload filament. It would be nice for it to be some sort of extrusion multiplier change. Because they're fully programmable, I believe that based on what the printer is doing, those buttons could do something else. If the printer is heating, maybe you could pre-program them to like change the temperature one or two degrees. Don't know. Is that me being picky and asking a lot? Well, yeah, probably. The main purpose for me, I don't know. I got blinking lights. Blinking lights are cool. It now also has lights to light up your print. And I know this is a really stupid thing, but how many of you have found yourselves looking at your first layer saying, oh man, oh man, oh man. And you just get kind of stuck in that tunnel vision of watching that first layer. I do it. I've been printing for 15 freaking years and I still do it because you know what? It's pretty. And with a light, I can look at it from a little bit further away and keep myself from getting hit by the heat bed. Uh, Leave a like if that's ever happened to you, I guess. And this is insane to me. There are 21 Hall Effect sensors in an XL with all five tool heads on it. That is a lot of Hall Effect sensors. I'd be curious to see how many go into each tool head. Is that, what, four per tool head and then one on the bed somewhere? Like, where do these Hall Effect sensors go? The cool thing about Hall Effect sensors is that you can use them for closed loop stepper driving. And I'm wondering if that's what Prusa is doing because that would effectively eliminate skip steps. If you can detect skip steps utilizing a Hall Effect sensor, you can instantly detect when they occur tell the printer to stop, pause, up its motor current to push through, whatever it might be. Hall effect sensors have a lot of value to them. Now, I did see an XL running at East Coast Rep Rap Festival. We'll cart that video so you guys can take a look. And it was running okay. To be clear, a lot of the XLs that go to trade shows are not the bell of the ball, right? They're some level of prototype, and they're obviously not going to be a finalized product because, well, they're still giving us updates, so why would they have finalized products ready to go to trade shows, right? They're showing you development. And it had some issues with the layers lining up, but you know what? It was pretty good given how not so reliable tool changers have been in the past. And the tool change was stupid fast. And I do like that they are allowing the purchase of an adapter, or it might even come with it, I'm not 100% sure, that will allow you to use 
any V6 compatible nozzle. So you know this guy is going to be popping diamond nozzles on every single one of my tool heads. But I do like that they are opening up the nozzles to not require Prusa specific nozzles. I think that's really important, especially for a lot of us that have V6 nozzles laying around. And as a lot of us are switching over to Revos, the old V6 nozzles just kind of sit around because Revos are great, man. They're really, really useful. This is a Prusa edition that is going on to one of our Prusas here relatively soon. But I have a pretty serious collection of V6 nozzles laying around. And if I can put them onto the XL, great. That's five nozzles that I don't have to worry about anymore. And of course, that means development around the V6 nozzle, whether it's from E3D or other companies, is not going to cease instantly with the Revo coming out. Allowing that ecosystem to still exist is amazing for people that want to mess around. And because they're not forcing you into an ecosystem, no matter what the price might be, it gives a more broad option right from the beginning. You don't have to wait for Prusa to have hardened nozzles like we had to with the E3D Obsidian. A lot of people were anxious to get the Obsidian because, well, we were used to having hardened nozzles on the V6. And if that all happened again, I don't think that would go well for Prusa. So I'm glad to see that they're allowing us to use the inventory that most of us already have. I dig that. Of course, um, you know, make a loss. Come on. They're having the Extendo spool holders to let you put on the 2.3 kgs if you want looks like pci ish style systems and unfortunately no ray trace printing with rtx graphics cards oh which one of you idiots is going to be the first one to do it which one of you is going to put a graphics card into your Prusa XL and kill one of the two things? And I do like that it is now actually coming with a built-in Wi-Fi module with the possibility to connect an external antenna. And they've opted for the well-known ESP32 Room 32, so wireless networks will be supported from the get-go. Now, I'm not a huge fan of Wi-Fi on printers. I don't need more things on my network clogging up certain channels and certain... Certainly, I'm not a huge fan of machines that talk back to the companies that make them. But at least with Prusa, if it is going to do that, they will tell you. But I doubt I will be Wi-Fi networking it. Like, I'm going to be doing big prints on this. It's not going to be something that is doing a thousand of a very small part. We have a farm for that. The XL is designed for larger parts or multiple, uh, multiple colors or whatever you want to do. I don't see myself using the Wi-Fi very often. It's a nice to have, but it's not a requirement in my eyes. What do you guys think about the Wi-Fi? And if you pay close attention, you'll notice something that looks like tree supports. This is what Prusa is calling organic supports. It is coming in Prusa Slicer 2.6. I'm wondering what the vegan supports will look like or the free range supports will look like, but I mean, come on, they're tree supports. I, I get that it's a meme to call it anything but tree supports, but for those that do like tree supports, it's time. And you know what? I think I'm going to give it a shot. I'm a snug support fanboy. They just freaking work, but I'm told tree supports are pretty much the next big thing. Of course, supply chain, supply chain, supply chain is always going to be a problem with machines like this. They've ran into issues with linear rails. And when you're looking at a printer like this, linear rails are one of the most important features. If your linear rails suck, your printer's going to suck. There is no way around this. That likely has to do with quite a bit of the delays that we've been seeing. Now, the skeptics out there might say, well, Prusa's is kind of sandbagging so that they can make changes so that they can meet the X1 Carbon in its own territory. I don't think so. I asked about this. I actually asked Mikolas about this. It wasn't on a recorded conversation. We were just kind of hanging out one night at Earth. And he said, no. In fact, he said, I personally welcome Bamboo. It is good to have a company that will start to challenge some of the more affordable brands and even challenge Prusa to do better. Because if we don't, we get complacent. And complacency is how companies die. I wish I had recorded that because it was a really cool statement to hear from a staff member at Prusa Research. Anyways, the big thing that you all been looking for, Jan 2023, that's when printers are going to start to ship. Let's move on to their next big announcement. And we've got Prusa Mint Refills, really cool master spool style, matte PETG, and flexible and bio-based resins that are, of course still toxic. I've wondered about master spool refills for cardboard spools. It is no secret that companies are moving away from the 
plastic spools and moving into spools that are made of cardboard. They're better for the environment, they're easier to deal with, and a lot of times they can be made more affordably. But master spools were one of the big reasons that people stuck with plastic spools, because you could just undo the spool, put the new master spool coil on, cut off the zip ties, and you were ready to go. Well, companies like Prusa and Printed Solid, of course, we toured recently. We'll cart that video so you guys can take a look. I really enjoyed that tour. It was really cool to see how filament is made. And if you're always wondering, that's my version of a how it's made video with way more excitement and way less monotone talking. Sorry. But this is how Prusa is dealing with it. They're keeping the cardboard core and all you have to do is just put the ends on it. That's just bloody brilliant. And I can understand that one of the big issues here was making sure that your beautifully wound coil didn't just somehow F off into Never Never Land randomly during the spooling, shipping, whatever it might be. Because of course, when something leaves your factory, it's all on shipping companies, which historically not that reliable, but I do like this. And we are looking at about a 7% cost savings when we compare the regular spools to these refills. So $26.99 versus $29.99, still a premium price for the filament. But if you got a bunch of Prusa spools laying around, it's a great way to save a couple of bucks still get that good quality filament and produce less waste. It's a win-win-win as far as I'm concerned. Matt PETG, not too much talk about there. It's PETG, that's not shiny. I like it, I'm excited for it. You might be, you might not care, Matt PETG. The big thing to me is bio-based resins. Plant-based resin has always been a bit of a sour spot for me. These eco resins, as companies tend to call them, that are plant-based have a tendency to be, well, shit. And they will end up cracking or they'll just end up having problems and they just don't print well. They say eco and they say plant-based, but they completely ignore the fact that it is still toxic. Resin is toxic. Do you all want merch that says that at some point? Like, I really feel like we should be putting resin is toxic on merch. Not that I've already been testing that, but if you wanted to have some of that, let me know down below. And I like that they are using upwards of 60% plant-based media. Looking at the cost of it, it's nice, but it is still pretty expensive. Prusa resin is not known for being cheap. If you want a cheap resin, you can go buy it from some no-name company on Amazon. And if you want affordable resin that is pretty decent, we've been using Soriatek for years. I am looking to get some Prusa resin, but I'll tell you, it is a tough pill to swallow when you're looking at at least double the price, unless you buy big packs of it. But plant-based Based is good because we use less harmful chemicals. Does that mean that you can drink the forbidden smoothie? No, you can't. Don't drink resin. Resin is toxic. In fact, I would have had you bet. Yep, Brusa has a full disclosure right here on their page. It will still kill aquatic life. It is still harmful to humans. Don't touch it basically. And they've got some flex resin. Now, a lot of us have been used to using flexible, tenacious resin from Soraya Tech. It's what we use here. And I've never printed with it pure. I normally dope all of our resin with it because it keeps your parts from being so brittle. And I'll be curious to compare tenacious versus Prusa Flex 80. Should be a lot of fun. And of course, similar to the plant where it's bio-based 60 resin, where it's 60% plant-based media, their Flex 80 has a short value of 80A. Let's take a look at shore values. My favorite one comes from SmoothOn. If you guys don't know SmoothOn and you're into the silicone world, what? How do you not know SmoothOn? And if you aren't into doing silicone casting and all that, go check out SmoothOn. They're a little pricey, but they give you stuff like this that helps out. So this Prusa resin is a 80A. Let's take a look at shore A value at 80. It's about a shoe heel worth of flexibility, so not too bad. Quite a bit harder than a pencil eraser, but nowhere near as bad as a shopping cart wheel. I like this because it's like things that you understand, right? We all kind of understand what a rubber shoe heel feels like. 
It's a vulcanized rubber material. But this would be really nice to dope your Prusa resin with because up until now, there really hasn't been a way to do it. But yeah, guys, let me know what you think of these Prusa announcements down in that comment section below. I'm excited for the XL. That's all I got for you guys today. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. It, actually, and if you are in the United States, uh, happy Thanksgiving. It's tomorrow. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one. Hey, thanks so much for watching this video. And a massive thank you goes out to all of our Patreon and YouTube channel member supporters whose names are listed right next to me at the $5 tier and higher. Remember, if you want to join that elite group of musketeers, you can do so by clicking those links in that description down below and pledging for as little as $1 a month. Right below me will be the first video in the Prusa XL update series. And next to that will be our coverage of the East Coast Rep Rep Festival 2022. I'll see you all down in those comments and in the next one. Take care.